Man, I got to tell you, when I was sitting here watching what all the other honorees have done with their lives, I started feeling like shit, like this is terrible. <laughs> and then Bobo brought me up and started out good with that Ali picture and then it just, whew. But that, that coloring book that was in the picture, I know the Ali's are here, that coloring book, I, I, my mother has it. And uh, the champ, he, he signed it. You know, the greatest, he signed it, Muhammad Ali. And his sparring partner was there that day. And his sparring partner signed it, said the next heavyweight champion in the world, Larry Holmes. And he was. And two-year-old Dave Chappelle colored all in that shit and just ruined the book. <laughs> But I remember part of the book that I remember real vividly because I asked my mother about it when I was a kid. Is, there's a part where there's a picture of Ali throwing his Olympic gold medal into the Ohio River. That's why it's so weird for me being here. You know, both of my parents were, were very brilliant. My dad went to Brown in 1955. That's right. He, he told me at the time he was one of three black students. He said one of the guys got accused of a rape that he probably didn't commit. And the other guy killed himself, and dad said, and, and I left. <laughs> and see, that's what makes us Chappelle's great. We know when to quit. <laughs> we all just live to fight another day. I gotta say, uh, I'm, very, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm very honored to be here with, with the other honorees. Really, I'm like very humbled by you all, the work that you do, and you all make me wanna be better. Uh, all of you. And you know, uh, I was gonna stop doing stand-up for a while, because four comedy specials in a year is like, that's a lot, you know. But I, and, you know, shout out to my colleagues in comedy. Uh, I just want I just want to say that in in a way, this for me belongs to my mother primarily, who was a African American studies professor, and uh, a lot of the content that I, you know, that I say, she, you know, she raised me well. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an uninformed person. Uh, but also, you know, my colleagues in comedy, like comedians have been getting beat up pretty bad recently, and, and we're somehow nowadays expected to speak with the precision of attorneys or politicians. We are not. I always think of James Baldwin. You know, James Baldwin was one of my favorite writers because he managed to tell white people what they feel like to be around. So I ain't gonna hang up my gloves yet. I think I got one more special in me. So to quote Baldwin, God gave Noah the rainbow sign. It's no more water, it's the fire next time. Thank you very much. And so if you would, please join me in welcoming Dave Chappelle home again. Oh, thank you. You know, um, I, I speak for a living, and, and I'm, a, I, I'm a little nervous today. I, I wanted to say thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Bishop Green, and, and thank everyone at Allen University for hosting me today, because it, it feels special, right? When I, when I think of this great-grandfather that I've heard about in my life, but never, never actually touched his legacy. So it's like the product of his loins coming to meet the product of his work. And, and it's, a, it's an important day for me personally. And I know a lot of you guys are students, uh, and I just want to tell you I'm the first person in my family to not go to college. 
Uh, and as uh, the president has told you, I've done outstanding in spite of that. <laughs> but one thing I did want to say, and one thing today just made me think about, for all the things that I've done, I'm most renowned for what I didn't do. I, I've made decisions in my career that a lot of people have called insane. 2004, I had a $50 million deal on the table, and in a crisis of conscience, flipped the table over and walked away. Went to South Africa. Everyone said I was running away from the money. That is not true. In fact, I still want that money. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that I wanted to just share with you guys is the idea that sometimes you, you do what you think is best, uh, whether anybody understands it or not. I heard a story about my father where someone told me he used to do statistics for a company in D.C. The company he did statistics for started doing business with the South African government, so he quit his job. It's caused a lot of problems between his, him and his wife. It's hard for a man when he can't provide for his family the way he wants to, and he suffered through it. And a generation later, when I had my crisis of conscience, I was able to go to a free South Africa and get away from the heat. This idea that what you do in your lifetime informs the generations that comes after you is something like keep thinking about something that is so much bigger than just ourselves. And today I'm standing in front of you guys, and I know you guys are like, oh, I know you're bored. But I see family of mine in the front row that, that I, some who I've never met, and I just realize how, how all, all of us are, are connected. That my great grandfather built something more substantial than buildings, he, he built a community. And he built, more importantly than a community, he, he built a way, you know. So I'm very grateful, uh, very grateful. Hello, police. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just saw him saying, you know what I mean? He's standing over like, so this is what black people talk about. <laughs> Uh, I just want, I just want, I just want you guys to remember, you know, that right now there's this thing where, where ethics aren't what they used to be. This idea that people are trying to replace the ideas of good and bad with better or worse, and that is incorrect. You gotta keep your ethics intact because uh, good and bad is a compass that helps you find the way. And a person that only does what's better or worse is the easiest type of person to control. They are a mouse in a maze that just finds the cheese. But the one who knows about good and bad will realize that he's in a maze. So, that being said, I just hope that all of you guys transcend whatever you see as your obstacles and that you live outstanding lives and that you stay connected to your communities because you have so much power there and that you grow your communities and you diversify your communities and that you don't let anybody, anybody, tell you you can't or to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid because you can't be brave or courageous without fear. The idea of being courageous is that even though you're scared, you just do the right thing anyway. So in 2004, I walked away from $50 million and in November, I made a deal for $60 million. So, <laughs> although I am not the most famous comedian of my time, I would like to know what their great-grandfathers did. I'm, I'm very proud today. Thank you very much. comes as a complete surprise. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I read all the reviews, and they said so many terrible things. They were embarrassed for me. I had lost my way. It wasn't even worth watching. I hope all you critics learn from this. This is a teachable moment. Shut the fuck up forever. Two in a night. These aren't them. These are the ones I won for the other ones, motherfucker. I would like to thank my editor who was nominated. Unfortunately, he did not win, but I couldn't have been more honored to work with Jeff Urin. Stan Lathan has been directing television since 1968. Any show that I watched when I was growing up, he directed it from Sesame Street to Sanford and Son, to Good Times, to Everything Black, and finally, you motherfuckers finally gave him an Emmy tonight. He deserves so much more, but I'm glad you came around. I'd like to shout out all the other nominees tonight. Tiffany Haddish and Patton Oswalt and Hannah Gatsby and, and Brother Mulaney. You guys are an inspiration to me, and I'm honored to be nominated with you. I'm sorry that you didn't win tonight, but who gives a fuck anyway? <laughs> it's a special night because comedy gets to be itself. It's all we've ever wanted. I hope the war is over. We good? And as always, I love you. Thank my wife, Elaine. That's right. Elaine has been with me for the last 25 years and had to endure the pains of living with the greatest comedian ever. <laughs> See you on Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I like not knowing what's going to happen. I like making memories. Sometimes I do all this crazy shit around my colleagues just so that they can tell their friends I did it. <laughs> but rather than talk about myself, just briefly, I want to just talk about my genre. Stand-up comedy is an incredibly American genre. I don't think any other country could produce this many comedians. And unbeknownst to many people in this audience, I don't think there's opinion that it exists in this country that is not represented in a comedy club by somebody. Each and every one of you has a champion in the room. We watch you guys fight, but when we're together, we talk it out. I know comics that are very racist. And I watch them on stage, and everyone's laughing, and I'm like, mm, that motherfucker means that shit. <laughs> don't get mad at them, don't hate them. We go upstairs and have a beer, and sometimes I even appreciate the artistry that they paint their racist opinions with. Man, it's not that serious. The First Amendment is first for a reason. The Second Amendment it's just in case the first one doesn't work out. <laughs> we gotta let some air out of the ball, man. The country's getting a little tight. It doesn't feel like it's ever felt in my lifetime. So tonight, I am honored that my colleagues are here in comedy and in music. And I want everyone in America right now to look at me. Look at me smoking indoors. <laughs> I didn't ask anybody, I just did it. What are they gonna do, kick me out before I get the prize? No, nigga, this is called leverage.
The thing that I liked best about tonight was that I saw so many people from different parts of my life, like friends that I grew up with here in D.C., friends of mine from Ohio then and now, friends of mine from comedy clubs, all the fucking musicians that blew my mind. You guys have no idea how you inspired me. I, I, I want to give a special shout out to my OG, Tony Woods. Miles Davis has a, a quote. Uh, it's one of my favorite, Miles Davis said so much cool shit, but, but one of the things he said I always loved, he said, it took me years to learn how to play like myself. You know, he would watch other musicians and he would try to play like Dizzy or Bird, or all the guys who were great. Tony Woods was my Dizzy and Bird if I was a Miles. I was trying to play like you. You were the first person I ever saw do it absolutely right. You were fearless and you told the truth. There's something so true about this genre when done correctly that I will fight anybody that gets a, a true practitioner of this art form's way because I know you're wrong. This is the truth and you are obstructing it. I'm not talking about the content, I'm talking about the art form. Do you understand? Do we have an agreement? And what I really wanted to say tonight, and I'm glad I get the platform to do it, I'm gay. <laughs> I am gay, and I can't wait to see what this does for my career, being gay like this. <laughs> so many special shout outs. One of the main architects of the comeback of the century, my brother and my mentor, the mighty Stan Lathan. I never dreamed that I would be able to work with someone as great as you. But these last five specials, straight fire. I wouldn't want to do another special with anybody else but you. So eat your motherfucking vegetables and live as long as you can, because we doing a few more of these bitches. <laughs> Neil Brennan, your speech made me cry because it reminded me of all those hard days of work and all that money I never got for it. <laughs> the other real special shout out I gotta make, because none of this would have been possible on any level uh, without this person, is my mother. Mom. <laughs> my mother. Mom, 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 mom. You have no idea what I put this woman through. If you had just given birth to me, that would have been more than enough. But the fact that you raised me and raised me well, we had a real oral tradition in our house. I knew the word griot when I was a little boy. A griot was a person in Africa who was charged with keeping the stories of the village. Everyone would tell a griot the stories and they would remember them all so that they could tell future generations. And when they got old, they'd tell them to someone else. And they say in Africa, when a griot dies, it's like, a library was burnt down. And my mother used to tell me, before I ever thought about doing comedy, she said, you should be a griot. And she'd fill me with every story of black life. You know, she's educated in African-American studies, and she would let me understand the context that I was being raised in, that I'm being raised in a hostile environment that I have to tame. By the time I was 14 years old, I was in nightclubs, mastering an adult world. It was terrifying. Crack epidemic was going on, and my mother would hear gunshots outside and be scared to death. Maybe it's my son. But early in my career, if you remember, Mom, you used to sit in the club with me. She'd so do a full day of work. You'd be back there falling asleep just waiting for me to go on. She would watch my show every night. Do you know how long that car ride is home? <laughs> how many of you have ever heard your mother say, Pussy jokes were a little too much tonight, son. <laughs> I was a soft kid. I was sensitive, I'd cry easy, and I would be scared to fist fight. And my mother used to tell me this thing, I don't even know if you remember, but you said this to me more than once. You said, son, sometimes you have to be a lion so you can be the lamb you really are. I talk this shit like a lion. I'm not afraid of any of you when it comes word to word. I will gab with the best of them, just so I can chill and be me. 
And that's why I love my art form, because I understand every practitioner of it. Whether I agree with them or not, I know where they're coming from. They want to be heard. They got something to say. There's something they notice. They just want to be understood. Love this genre. It saved my life. So tonight, Mom, I would like to honor you in a very special way that I cannot do on my own. But because now I'm a man with great and influential friends, I'd like to ask my man Thundercat to come out on stage. Thundercat, the mighty most deaf. Washington, D.C., thank you very much for giving me a home and a place to start. Today is officially a Dave Chappelle Day in Washington, D.C. The mayor declared it last night. So, in the future, on Dave Chappelle Day, I ask everyone who wishes to celebrate it to make one incredible memory for themselves and or somebody else. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>